I was asked if I was interested in making a video, which would be a response to this particular statement. Is, is that not my culture? You don't have a fucking culture! I don't? No, you don't! Oh! We're fucking white, we don't have a goddamn fucking culture! Are you? The outburst of this young man went viral. For various reasons, it also irritated a great many people. Well, for a while I thought about it, thinking this might be a tough ask. But then I decided, yes, it was in fact necessary for someone to respond. Of course, many have already replied with outrage or ridicule toward this statement. But to my knowledge, no one has taken the time to actually make the case. Why this crass outburst is so wrong. Now first, let me be clear about a few things. I do not own the copyright on some of the material I am posting here. Wherever possible, I have used, as I usually do, material which is in the public domain. Much of the material I used here is too. But some is not. However, all will be subject to critique, and none will be played in its entirety. This should be fair use. Making the point I wish to make would be much harder, if not impossible, without this material. Next, I want to be clear. I am not a white supremacist. I never have been. I never will be. My aim here is not to prove that white people are the greatest and best. If you are looking for that, pray go elsewhere. I am responding to the preposterous claim that white people have no culture. Not only is that patently untrue, as everyone has a culture, even Americans, but to single out white people as those devoid of culture, when the peoples of Europe have created the deepest, richest cultural structures in the world, demonstrates a level of ignorance hard to fathom. How it is possible that our universities are churning out people who are supposedly educated, yet are so devoid of knowledge that they should think white people merely appropriators of others' culture is beyond me. So where to start? It is always best, I guess, to start at the beginning. Human civilization knows of two cores. The first is the Western core, where civilization began. The second is the Eastern core, centered around China. But when we speak of the West today, we really mean the Western extension of the Western core which split off into an independent entity millennia ago. The people we point to for this are the Greeks. The Greeks were most likely the most creative, innovative civilization of all times. Their contribution to the world is monumental. Already here we find the idea of democracy, great advances in art and science. But so too did the Greeks invent the concept of the Olympic Games, as well as other sporting contests. So if you have been cheering Usain Bolt, declaring him the greatest athlete ever, remember that he shone because he was able to perform not merely in an organised contest itself, situated in a stadium, but that he became an Olympic champion, an ideal created by dead white men, as so many like to deride those of European stock who went before. This is a profound cultural legacy left behind by the Greeks. In architecture, Greece excelled too, giving us the Parthenon, one of the most memorable structures on earth. But the one legacy I would like to point out to you, a great personal love of mine, is sculpture. Here we have in the Vatican, one of the greatest Hellenistic sculptures to come down to us through the ages. It is the figure of Laarchon and his sons being beset by snakes which sprung from the earth sent by the gods. Laarchon was a man who was seeking to warn the Trojans not to take the great wooden horse into their city. Take a good look at this figure. Imagine the sheer craft, but so to the vision it requires to carve this from solid rock. But please also keep in mind that this great work of art, like so often is the case, is the product of several art forms coming together. For literature first needed to create Laarchon, for a sculptor ever to imagine this piece. No other civilization on earth did this at the time. None found such beauty in the human form as did the Greeks. If you wish to know why the current world is so obsessed with the body beautiful, look no further than the Hellenistic world. They aspired to ideals. 
They celebrated both the ideal, but so too the attempt at the ideal. Today's rising of relativism has no time for such ideals. We are all beautiful, we are told, be we fat, short, stubby or deformed. The truth is we are not, neither were the Greeks, but they were not afraid to aspire, to dream. Rome, of course, too, was part of the Hellenistic world, though she gave it her very own flavour. And whereas we these days marvel at Rome's great legions, not least as it makes for good cinema, her most profound gift was most likely law. When you hear an American endlessly blather on about the Constitution and this or that amendment, what you hear is a Roman. For to the Romans their republic was sacred. They too could drone on endlessly about their constitution and the intentions of their forefathers. They gifted us this. Their great body of law was worked into much of European law in later years, most notably English and French law. Again, the Romans were white men. They were not a people of Australasia or South America. They were European. They were of the western side of the western core. And as we know, Rome did not skimp on her architecture. Under her emperors she built the Colosseum, the very mother structure of all modern-day sports stadia. But so too did she give us the Pantheon, a temple which has survived into modernity intact, simply as it was converted into a church very early on. Its concrete dome, built under Emperor Hadrian, still stands flawless today. Now please do not worry. I do not intend to go through all human history step by step. But just as with Greece and Rome, I intend to show you a few highlights here and there, showing you the roots of some aspects of Western culture. So next, let us go on to Durham Cathedral, a magnificent Romanesque structure begun in the 11th century. I take this simply as one example among many of the sheer capacity of Western builders in the Middle Ages to excel even beyond some of the ability of Rome to fashion towering houses of God, which knew no equal anywhere in the world. Please contemplate, if you will, the sheer skill this took, both in design and in execution. This was absolutely cutting edge in its day. Men working at the edge of what was physically possible, with the materials and technologies they had to hand. But now let us take a leap into music and dance. Let us first have a look at what some other cultures may offer. Here we have some African tribal dancers in Botswana. Now this is a pure form of dance. It takes skill to do this, an innate feeling, talent. But its sophistication really ends in there being some choral backing music. There is no great composition at work here. No great architecture for a theatre hall in which this is being performed. The choreography you suspect is traditional, having been handed down through generations. There are no musicians who have dedicated their lives to the perfection of their craft here. Now let us delve instead into European territory. This is Iana Salenko, dancing the dance of the sugar plum fairy in the ballet The Nutcracker. This is a display of peak physical performance by a lady who has dedicated herself to achieving the physical and mental attributes necessary to being a prima ballerina. Watch closely, and gravity at times appears to cease to exist. Everything about her movement is grace and poise. This is magnificence. A further step taken in the lineage of the physical ideal created by the Greeks many years before. This is culture in almost its purest form classical music, played by dedicated, highly trained musicians on precise, standardised instruments, working from sheet music by a great composer, costumes and set design again by highly skilled artisans. Finally, all of it is set in a theatre which required architectural artistry to build, all to produce this moment of sublime grace. Whether you like ballet is irrelevant in this respect. It is a high cultural marker. Almost everything related to it requires a great deal of sophistication and years of dedication. But why end there? Let us look at song, shall we? Opera, to be more precise. 
two cultures have created what we would call opera. China and Europe. Europe's foremost operatic civilization is, of course, Italy. Mozart may have been a brilliant operatic composer and an Austrian, but the cultural influence was almost inescapable, as Austria ruled over northern Italy at the time. But let us begin with Peking Opera. Now this is, without a shadow of a doubt, sophisticated fare. It requires a theatre, singers, musicians, costume makers, set designers. But is the result something that can reach beyond the initiated? Is it truly universal? Moreover, does the main craft, the singing, require the same level of dedication to perfection which European opera demands? Let us put this to the test, shall we? We will start with a piece you will most likely know. These two ladies are singing Solaria from La Nozze di Figaro. It is one of the most warm, touching pieces of opera you will ever hear. Their delivery is immaculate. You will possibly know this piece as this song featured in the movie The Shawshank Redemption, when the hero breaks the prison rules to play this music on the loudspeaker system, setting all the prisoners free for one beautiful moment. The two are Cecilia Bartoli and René Fleming, who are outstanding in their delivery. Their singing and Mozart's immortal tune combine into something so beautifully feminine it can be understood without language anywhere on the planet. This is about love. But for maybe the ultimate songbird, we need look to Diana Damrau, here performing as an angry queen of the night in Mozart's magic flute. Mozart created this piece for a particularly gifted soprano of his age. To be able to perform this at this level, you must be gifted with a natural talent. Without such talent, you need not even begin to try. But more so, you need to dedicate your life to being able to sing like this. To become a living, breathing musical instrument. The result is one of the most iconic pieces of music ever conceived. Delivered by someone who has reached the highest level of human vocal control. But from Diana Damrau to another brilliant proponent of opera. Here is no lesser than Luciano Pavarotti, at the very height of his powers, singing La Donna e Mobile from the opera Rigoletto by Verdi. Not only does he demonstrate the voice of a god, but the sheer power he delivers is effortless. The man is not even trying. This is vocal swagger. A cockerel strutting across the farmyard. The Greek ideal is taken to another plane. The marriage of the ideal in physique, intellect and soul. No longer the athlete, but the artist. The artist as God. Hey, 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 
Of course, you cannot speak of artists as gods if you do not touch upon the two men who most resemble that notion. Both have come to be in our minds the embodiment of the Italian Renaissance. In fact, a great many people more than likely believe that these two men were the Italian Renaissance. The Renaissance was not a matter of one lifetime. These two were contemporaries and they may represent its pinnacle, but they would hardly have claimed to have got there on their own. One was Leonardo da Vinci, who created the most famous painting of all time. The Mona Lisa beguiles to this day. Nobody knows exactly why. She is enigmatic, yet beautiful. A perfect, tender rendition of an ideal. The more you look at her, the more she comes alive, feeding your imagination. In that strange way, you actually feel her. You feel her presence. It is the magic of art, great art, unimaginably great art. But it was not Leonardo, but his rival Michelangelo, whom the Italians in his day actually called the Divine. If Leonardo created the most famous painting of all time, it fell to Michelangelo to create the most famous sculpture. Again, here we have the absolute physical ideal. This is what man can be if nature, nurture and discipline combine. Maybe this is what man should be, or what he would dream to be. It is the essence, the spirit of man. Just as with the Mona Lisa, we are looking at something perfect, something divine, something which touches us on a level we cannot even comprehend. It is as though he who made this knew of something we do not. But Michelangelo was not yet finished. Having created the ultimate sculpture, enough to weary any man, he went on to decorate what was to become the most famous ceiling in the world, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. He did it against his will, commanded by the Pope, all the while insisting that he was a sculptor, not a painter. Among all this Herculean labour he created beauty. This is a mere detail among this vast work the Libyan Sibyl. With any other, this alone would have been deemed a masterpiece. With Michelangelo, it was a figure in the side panels. But among all this splendour was one panel, the likes of which no one had ever created. The artist captured the moment life was given to man. The creation of Adam is something so inspiring, nothing can really compare. Whatever your faith may be, if you hold with any faith at all or not, this touches you. It is about whence we came and what we are, and that there is a spark of the divine within us. It is easy to think of these works of art as merely being especially fine examples, but they are much more than that. You do not create such imagery, such ideas and concepts, without their leaving a mark on the world. With their example, they influence the culture. They affect the direction of travel. But so too must we understand that these powerful markers of Western culture do not represent the totality of the culture. They represent the very crest of a wave. But the wave is a good indicator of the ocean below. To achieve a Leonardo, to achieve a Michelangelo, a huge depth of culture needed first to be accomplished. They were the finest among legions of artists and thinkers. They were the fruits of a society which had dedicated itself to the furtherance of the mind and the soul, and above all, to the pursuit of an ideal. But do not think it ended there. Western man continued to strive. Bernini would come along, the man who boasted he could shape marble like wax. And when you behold his Apollo and Daphne, you can see a man at work who held with the standards of the great men who had gone before him. Seeking to escape the advances of the great god Apollo, the nymph Daphne turned herself into a tree. This sculpture captures the very moment at which this transformation begins. Her hair is sprouting branches and leaves. Her leg is turning into the trunk of a tree. Yet her body at the hip is still supple enough for the fingers of Apollo's hand to indent the flesh. The sense of movement and drama is staggering. Bernini was never the equal of Leonardo or Michelangelo. 
a master who put any sculptor in the rest of the world to shame. No other civilization could even hope to compete. Here is his rendition of the blessed Ludovica Albertoni in Ecstasy. It is a tour de force of the sculptor's skill. At the height of his powers, Bernini could indeed shape marble like wax. Bernini, of course, was not alone. The seed of the Renaissance had sprouted into an explosion of artistry across the continent. To name one or two, in the Netherlands Rembrandt sparkled, astonishing us with canvases such as this, his most famous, The Night Watch. In Britain it was Thomas Gainsborough who granted his rich subjects immortality. But while some were building great cathedrals or capturing stunning beauty with paint or in stone, others were crafting words into something immortal. Gutenberg may have given the Western world printing, something the Chinese had had for a great length of time. Yet in the West it would lead to an explosion of literary expression, maybe with none more so than with one William Shakespeare. The playwright of playwrights, who put everyone to shame with both the depths of his tales as well as the beauty of his words. Here is Laurence Olivier with Hamlet's soliloquy. To be or not to be, that is the question. The profound words are granted yet more weight by the dreamlike quality of Olivier whose delivery of the English language always bestowed upon it yet greater nobility. The slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. Shakespeare made a great contribution not merely to fiction and the concept of theatre, but also to the English language itself. So too did another book of that time, the King James Bible. It matters not whether you are a Christian. You cannot avoid acknowledging the influence exerted upon the language by this great work. The scholars who toiled over it imbued it not merely with the meaning of the original Latin texts, but so too with the beauty of prose. Romans 12.2 And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Language has a power, and much of the Bible possesses that power of language. It was the King James Bible and the scholars who crafted it which granted religious teaching in the English-speaking world much of this power. But just like the works of Shakespeare, so did this Bible influence the language and how it was used. For words are not just vowels and consonants, they are a music by which the gifted speaker can play upon our emotions like an instrument. For so often we are the masters of our own words, but the slaves to those of others. And so we have beheld the imagery, the structures, the dance, the music and the prose of great masters, all in the pursuit of beauty. But the culture of the Western world is not merely shaped by the splendour of its everlasting aspiration toward beauty, toward the ideal. The West is also the crucible of technology, of invention. For as the ancient Greeks had given us our beginnings, and the Italians gave us our Renaissance, so have the British Victorians flung us into the modern age. The contraptions they built, silly as some may look to our eyes now, propelled us on with ever greater speed. Stevenson's rocket pulled the first passenger train from Liverpool to Manchester, and thereby catapulted the world into a new era. Isambard Kingdom Brunel, the greatest engineer of all time, gave us this, the SS Great Britain, an iron ship powered by steam and driven by a propeller. As we were hurled from the Victorian age further into modernity, the Flying Scotsman broke 100 miles per hour and became the most famous locomotive on Earth. The Mallard set the world record still standing today for a steam train at 126 miles per hour, pipping the Nazis to the crown. Another machine, 
perhaps one of the most graceful machines ever conceived, the Supermarine Spitfire, assured that those very same Nazis remained well and truly pipped. The world was speeding up to a Western rhythm, to a Western culture, a culture which would come to dominate the world, not merely because the West's wealth and military predominance would help spread it, but because the sheer depth and richness in texture meant that Western culture had no equal. It was Pavarotti or Peking opera. It was Iana Salenko or tribal dancing. For sure, I simplify, but it holds true nonetheless. No one could offer the world what we had amassed. No one can still. I shall let the moon landings take us out. After all, it is only right to let the colonials on the far side of the Atlantic have a little glory too. For this was maybe the ultimate technological accomplishment of the 20th century. It built upon centuries of learning and experience, and represented the ultimate daring leap of the modern age. I will not bore you with the usual soundtrack of Also Sprach Zarathustra, which is usually played on this occasion. I will instead opt for Beethoven's Ode to Joy. This is an epic sound. If the universe can think, then this is what its thoughts sound like. Whoever arranged this, whoever participated in the making of this gorgeous, wonderful noise, has touched immortality. Take it away, Ludwig. Now tell me again that white men have no culture. Tell me that we stem from a vacuous lineage which gave nothing to the world and which stands in the shadow of all the diverse civilizations of this earth. Tell me I have no culture. Else hold your tongue. That is all from the Sab Pass for now. Thank you very much, and goodbye.